Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of The War Report, and I am very pleased to report that our good friend Benjamin Netanyahu has finally been removed from office. <laughs> now, he had been in since 2010, 2011 last time, and of course he had a brief stint as Prime Minister in the 90s. Now, I'm sure you all remember him when he was not Prime Minister during the 2000s, right before the Iraq War, standing in front of Congress saying, If you take out Saddam, I can guarantee you that I'll have positive reverberations for the region. Not just Israel, but for the region. Or, <laughs> uh, yeah, we all saw that worked out. And either, just, just as an aside, the funny thing about the whole Iraq thing, the, the Lakutniks did definitely push for that, but it completely backfired on them. It was probably one of the worst mistakes they made in terms of empowering Iran and shifting the balance of power in the region, getting rid of Saddam Hussein. But that's aside the point, and let's just say Netanyahu's words, Netanyahu's actions have finally caught up with him. Barring these next 11, 12 days that he doesn't put together some glorious co coalition to combat Bennett and Lapid. Uh, those are the two who are set to replace him. Funny enough, we have a coalition between a centrist party with Yair Lapid, and I, I gotta figure out how to pronounce his name, because his name is, like, a mouthful. Uh, Naftali Bennett is the leader of the... Well, he was first part of the New Right Party, and then part of the Jewish Home Party. Very big advocates of settlements in the West Bank and annexation of the West Bank. You go into his record, he is pro giving Gaza to Egypt, giving part of Gaza to Egypt, clearing out the rest for, of Hamas, and more or less annexing the West Bank with some residual Palestinian authority control over it. So, one could argue he's even more hardline than Netanyahu and Likud on the Palestinian issue. But it is funny because Netanyahu was going off about how this is a left-wing conspiracy to unseat him and how... The, see, I'm, I'm, I am just like Donald Trump, they're trying to unseat me, of course what, about six, seven months after he drives the dagger into Trump's back by saying, oh, congratulations, Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. Okay, I'll stop doing the Netanyahu voice. It's, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think the shtick is worn off, but that's beside the point. But you have all of that happen within just this past week here. And, of course, this is after series of annual Israeli elections where Likud would take a plurality, but never would reach that majority or would never be able to form this coalition to actually form its own government. And it looks like that has finally caught up with Netanyahu in that the opposition parties are forming a grand coalition against him. And this isn't even Benny Gantz, who was on, um, like, center-right at most, mostly just a liberal center-left type. Somebody who probably would have gotten along well with people like Biden, people like Kamala, people like Obama. Like, the, the guy they would have wanted in power. But I do think it's funny, after all of this, after Israel gets egg on its face, and I would say after Israel mostly shows itself to be a paper tiger in the face of the Palestinian issue, as you were kind of saying last week with all of that, they, what I think is going on here is they're trying to save pa face by throwing Netanyahu to the curbs, putting all the blame for everything that went wrong on him. Look, it was Netanyahu's fault. He's out of office. The Likudniks are out of power because they botched the crisis. But now they have a combination of the we want to play nice, we want to be centrist people with Lepin or Lepid. And then you have the Israel's going to be even more tough on the Palestinians and the Iranians and the Syrians, etc., in the form of Bennett, and you get all these things the way they play out like that. And really, well, what can I say? You know, Netanyahu, he said those infamous three words some time ago, and it looks like that's finally caught up to him. Now, it took a while. It did take a while, <laughs> admittedly. Um, I mean, because think about it now, Obama got, you know, term limited, Hillary lost, uh, I mean, it's, if I went through everyone who's lost out to the South Coast, we'd be here all day. But point being is, <laughs> it took a while to get around to him, but it eventually did, which, I mean, looks like Erdogan better start hedging his bets. Let's see if he's made up for it. Let's see if his weird diplomacy, him walking that tightrope, is made up for it. We'll see in the near future, I imagine. But really, the course for Israel is so unclear, I cannot even begin to speculate 
what they're going to try to do. Again, I think they're going to try to have this sort of schizophrenic foreign policy that Trump had when he was in office of one face of it is we're nice, we're the centrists, we want to play by the rules, we want to be part of the world family, so to speak. And then the other one is we're going to go even harder than Likud on these evil Hamas terrorists and we're going to crush Israel's enemies and Israel is going to stand strong. Because, again, you have a guy who's in power who is a former leader of a party whose primary goal, if not sole goal, was, yeah, we should annex the West Bank. And that's even a bit far by Israeli standards. Because most of them will say, we should annex, I don't know, 80% of the West Bank, 90% of the West Bank, this, this, and this settlement. But rarely will one out come out right and say, yeah, just annex the whole thing. Now, he said that he's waffled on that statement, but that's generally his stance. It's generally the stance of a lot of people, but it's just very brazen coming out of his mouth and the way he says it, where, again, you have this centrist who really, again, just walks the tightrope on this issue, and it looks like Israel is trying very hard to really play up both sides, that the strong country, that's the only, that is the thin line of defense between the West and Islamic terrorists, and also this modern liberal democracy. <laughs> and, again, this is on top of a country that had just, I would say, over the past month, had lost... Gee, how much credibility on the world stage, even the Anglosphere, its traditional supporters, even people on the right wing, maybe they're not like outright condemning Israel, maybe they don't like Hamas, whatever, maybe they're still pro-Zionist, but how enthusiastically are they pro-Zionist, the real question at this point. Yeah, I mean, a lot of this is window dressing, and window dressing uh, is sufficient uh, for... You know, many people who t tune into, uh, you know, American media. Uh, but the, the problems are still there. Uh, I, I suppose the, the bigger looming issue is the JPCOA. Um, I can't imagine that this government will. I, 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 in fact, I can't imagine any Israeli government that is going to be in favor of the JPCOA. And so the real struggle now will happen. You know, we will see, uh, you know, who's wagging the dog. So, well, Hamas is an issue and, and uh, it's low hanging fruit for all kinds of propaganda uh, in order to uh, justify more settlements uh, encroaching into Palestinian territory. Uh, the, the fact of the matter is uh, there's certain strongholds that are going to be very difficult for the Israelis to, to move out. And generally speaking, they're losing favor with the younger crowd. Now, I understand younger crowds tend to be more liberal anyways, and uh, they'll always go for the underdog and uh, considered, you know, the old stodgy established power powers as uh, the enemy. I get that, but um, it is rising nonetheless. And we've, dis you know, we've we've covered this subject before that America's population is changing, and it's not a population that is really going to be invested in Israel. And in fact, we'll probably start asking questions why it's so invested in Israel. Because if you use the argument that, that, that you know, it's Israel that's stopping, you know, Islamofascism from attacking the West, well, I mean, it's done a really bad job. <laughs> it's, it's been doing a really horrible job ever since 9-11. So, um, that's that, that that's not something easily proven and uh well you know we'll 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 have to see how how it goes i found it interesting that netanyahu was tweeting about you know don't let the leftists take over it's like what leftists like what what are you talking about um i i, I don't think there's anybody that's going to be in this new government uh, should he survive the next 12 days, um, that is going to uh, ag agree to the JPCOA. I, I just, 
I just don't foresee that, considering that this week uh, Iran's largest military ship sank. And on the same day, a fire broke out at one of its biggest refineries. It's still on fire. Today is day two, by the way. And so, uh, I mean, was this just a, you know, a weird coincidence? I, I doubt it. And on top of that, you had IDF detonating the positions of Syrian strongholds in the disputed territories of the Golan Heights. Now, there was no active combat, but they were just demolishing these Syrian outposts. Yeah. So you can tell they're encroaching on that. No new strikes on Syria, nothing like that. But I wouldn't be surprised if we saw those in the coming week or so, yeah. coming 12 days. Yeah. But again, I, I was actually just about to say, I think Netanyahu might, of course, not outright start a war, but do something very brazen, very aggressive as a final glorious act in office or maybe as a bid to see, look, we're in a, in a national crisis. You need strong leadership. It, you cannot change government at this time, which he would be smarmy enough to do something like that. He's done things like that before, but that would be even just beyond something he's done, done before. Not that I'm saying he would be unwilling to do it. Time will tell, but be on the lookout for something just really big, really conspicuous in either Syria or Iran involving them in the next few mm. days, is what I would say. Mm -hmm. Or hell, maybe even between the time of recording this and by the time the show premieres, that will be the case. But with that being said, we can move on to some of the brief news about Syria here, and I can pull this up. I just need to get the map for Syria right here pulled up and of course we'll give you our wonderful key for the map and the map itself and drag that there and here we are so a rather uneventful week in Syria as we said of course you have the detonation of old IDF um, old Syrian posts by the IDF you had some activity in northwestern Syria even though most of that was internal skirmishes between opposition and Turkish-backed forces. And really, the only action on the Syrian offensive is one officer got killed within the past day. So, again, pretty quiet in Syria. Now, the, these things ebb and flow. I still hold my prediction that we're in the last summer of Idlib. But, again, not every week can be advancing 40 kilometers closer to the city. I mean, they've had weeks like that, especially like in 2018 when they were just on the war path, especially after Trump yanked a lot of funding for the Syrian rebels. You had just that whole hog. You uh -huh. haven't had much activity in northeastern Syria. The Kurds have been mostly docile, mostly dormant, perhaps. And again, just... A relatively low level week in Syria. Again, I just think it's because everyone is just buying their time seeing what to do next. And like I said, I still think we're probably going to get more news out of Syria. Of course, the big news is Assad just won re-election, which I still maintain is more legitimate than uh, a certain U.S. president who just got elected, but that's aside the point. And really, there's not much else to say about Syria unless you have anything? Yeah, I mean, the only, I mean, this one small item of news and one large one, a small one I'll say first, which is that, you know, despite Russia's bombing campaign, there's, it's obvious now that ISIS has made a comeback in Syria. Small as it is, it, is, it, it, it can't be overlooked. They are attacking anywhere from like around Afrin to the Alms Desert, um, they're re-entrenching themselves. And then there's uh, a portion of them that are going to be returning to Iraq because they're going to be let out of a Syrian prison that they're in that the Kurds have control over, which ostensibly means that the Americans have control over. And um, so we'll see how that plays out because, of course, they've already made a resurgence in Iraq as well. Probably because the U.S. and some of the Gulf Arab states in Israel are not happy with 
you know, the, the you know, success that um, Shia militias have made in Iraq, uh, particularly the last five, six years. Uh, that might change with the upcoming election, and it might change uh, if talks with the JPCOA uh, continue to develop in a, in, a, you know, in a positive manner. They might feel that they're no longer necessary uh, and w- could possibly um, uh, basically execute more you know, violent attacks on U.S. convoys and so on. So... That's the the first bit of news, but then there was something interesting that appeared in TASS. This is the the Russian newspaper. It claims, uh, according to a diplomatic source in Moscow, Jonathan Powell suggested that Abu Mohammed al Julani uh, should uh, build close cooperation with European countries and the U.S. Now, who is Abu Mohammed? Well, Abu Mohammed uh, was formerly in... uh, uh, Hayat Tahrir al Sham, um, connected with Al Nusra Front. Uh, so, of course, this is one of these rehabilitated jihadis. And uh, Powell, of course, is MI6 uh, intelligence. You can see that they're, they're, you know, they're, they have not given up on ousting Assad and they will use any means they, they, can at their disposal uh, in order to oust them, um, which is kind of interesting in the you know in, in the big picture because with Western audiences, like I think one of the reasons, like one of the reasons why I would say conservative Americans um, would argue that um, you know these measures, however bad they are, they're they're eventually going to give them. They're going to eventually give those people a better life. They're going to give them the American way of life, right? And liberals, in this respect, uh, with their universalist note, with their own particular universalist notions, uh, one of the reasons why they don't criticize uh, these terrorist groups, beside the much um, uh, avowed, um, you know, racism claims that they did, like, it doesn't really have anything to do with that. But they see that. If America can liberalize these countries, then it not only validates their morality and their way of life, but then those people, those good people of Syria will be able to enjoy a kind of lifestyle that they deserve. And and frankly, they should have. Uh, So I I find it interesting how that works. You know, from a sort of argument based in um, a civilizational uh, argument, right? Yes. Um, and yeah, so those those are my 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 two pieces that um, that stood out for me uh, with regards to Syria. I think you summed it up just as better, uh, just as much, if not better, than I could, and I really don't have much to add to that. So, moving on from that, we'll get into some of the, uh, depending on your point of view, either funny or sad news about the U.S. State Department's efforts this wonderful, wonderful month. So. For those of you who are still living in the dark, for whatever reason you may not know, unfortunately we are in the middle of Pride Month. Now, Ah. of course, it got overshadowed last year by racial tensions, so they're back with a vengeance, and nobody is going to be spared from every major corporation, every government agency, etc. Rainbow flags galore. I, I can only imagine it's worse up there in Canada, I imagine. Just... I, I don't know, I just get the feeling, even though I, I'm not saying it's good here by any means, granted, I, you know, fortunately I live in a red state America, but that can only do so much for you. And with all that being said, you have the U.S. State Department going whole hog. Now, under Trump the past couple of years, to his credit, they didn't allow the flying of rainbow flags on embassies. Now, they found ways around it, they would do giant projectors on building sides and everything, whatever, but under the leadership of Joe Biden, Kamala Harris, and Anthony Blinken, the rainbow flag is flying high and flying proud at U.S. embassies, including the embassy in Vatican City. Now, of course, some exceptions apply. 
You may think Saudi Arabia. You may think Qatar. You may think I don't. I don't know if they bothered to do it in China. I I know that they were trying to do it in Russia even before Pride Month. But again, of course, all the vassalized, all the colonized areas of the liberal empire, the rainbow flag is flying proud and tall. And some may argue at this point it might just be better to lower old glory and just let the rainbow flag really represent what it truly stands for, which is the American Empire from the 21st century onward. Which, you, you know, honestly, I think it would be less insulting to the historic American nation to the degree that it still still exists, mind you. Which I think uh, there's, you know, an argument to be had there that it's a sliver of anything, unfortunately. But, uh, again, all that, all that aside, you know, it may just be a more honest representation if we just keep the rainbow flags up all year round. And, uh, you know, at that point... Who knows? Who knows what path we're barreling towards. Maybe they still need some legitimacy in the eyes of the world. But it is Pride Month, truly. And, again, it is June 3rd as we're recording this. It will be June 4th by the time you guys see this. Maybe later. I don't know when you guys watch this. Some... We tend to get a lot of views after the fact, which, you know, of course, we appreciate all views. But uh, just so you know, the content, if you are listing, like, I don't know, say on June 7th, it's like four days outdated, so... Just keep that in mind yeah. if we have any discrepancies, if anything else cropped up, or we were proven wrong about one of our speculations, just just keep that in mind that, you know, these things, that this sort of news moves fast despite how much of a, like a, a broad scope we like to look at everything at. We, we look at very glacial things, but the a lot of these small elements still move fast, but again, I'm getting off on a bit of a tangent here. But point being is, from the corporations, from the government bureaucracies from just about anyone with any ounce of power in the United States, if not the Western world as a whole, is hoisting the rainbow flag high, hoisting it proud, and letting people know that they stand with global sodomy. Now, again, this is no surprise. Uh, it, it is interesting to see these takes from people I am, you know, I generally respect, and I'm not saying this decreases my respect for them or anything, but people who I know are intelligent in both my real life and people I follow online, that they're genuinely surprised that this is happening. And I can only think, like, you're a smart guy. Have you not been paying attention the past three or four years? Have you not been paying attention with how much they've been pushing this as a state ideology? Dare I say even a state religion? And, again, it seems like for both, like... I think it's good that people are waking up to this. I think it's good that they're finally realizing how ridiculous this is. But I think you're about, if I'm being generous, three, four years late. If not, you want to get back into the, even the gay marriage debate, and I don't know, 15, 20 years late. And again, I think they're making it so obvious now because they've won on the issue. They know, barring any sort of black swan event, they, they've won on this issue. They can make this issue their state ideology, and they can use this as a cudgel for not only domestic issues, but the rest of the world. The point where even the uh, head of the GOP, Ronna McDaniels, who is supposed to be this big you know, conservative stalwart, is talking about how great it is that the Republican Party can be such a big tent movement that includes both uh, gay rights and uh, religious liberties, because, you know what, they may control every other institution, and they may more or less control your religious institutions as well, but at least they can't do their weddings there. They may control every other aspect, and we may not fight them on any of that, but at least you can say, no, have your wedding at a different venue, because that is really, that's really where it comes standing up. And then, it, it reminded me, again, not to get on too much of a tangent, with what we had during all of this, 29 years ago, 1992, you had Pat Buchanan just completely railing on a lot of just pretty much social liberalism in general. And just in less than 30 years, you go from that at the Republican National Convention, and dare I even imagine what the 2024 Republican National Convention is going to look like. I do not want to go down that road. The 2020 RNC with Trump and everything wasn't horrible. It definitely had its issues, but that was to be expected. But, I mean, just comparing the rhetoric of, like, the far-right stalwart conservative party, the uh, and especially considering how far Trump alleged really push the party and how they're such radical extremists now. Again, this is what the Republican establishment is saying, so 
I know I've made this point a million times. I know all of you listening to this probably already know this. But just remember, within the establishment, within the institutions, you have zero friends, you have zero allies. They will rally around the state religion. They have no care for your religious beliefs, no care for your culture. If it's not rainbow and it's not non-binary, gender-fluid, X, Y, Z, they do not care for it. Even the so-called right wing does not care for it. Now, again, you know, maybe you can get away with a little bit more on the right, but if it if it's not making money and it's not rainbow-painted then you're screwed. I, I'm, I hate to tell you it, but you're screwed. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, it, it's become the, the like it, you mentioned quite correctly, that it's a cultural. But it, it, it's, it's also a way for the state to ignore um, other problems. So, um, you know, let's say, um, not so much the infrastructure debate, but the, the, the question of... Um, um, wage stagnation. Um, let's say the issue of inflation, right? You, you've got other bigger issues that you know a normal country would be able to address reluctantly. Uh, the wealthy class would try to figure out how they could, you know, kick the can down the road. But um, the thing with with wokeism is it is like. It, for instance, if you work in a corporation, you know very well, wokeism is literally the number one issue. So that all the employees understand that things like uh, your wage uh, are not like the highest priority. Um, you know that the bank has very, very high priorities, but uh, they're not the ones that maybe you would guess. Um Another example is the way that you have, you know, aspirational public figures. You know, these are unknowns that um, come out of the woodwork. You saw this last year during um, the riots, right? So everybody knew that, you know, um, the lockdowns would cause economic havoc, uh, people were really struggling. And I think, you know, the fallout is going to be really felt by the end of this year. But the issue of race relations became overblown. And so that took, you know, that dwarfed everything. And of course, you know, uh, the the so-called build back better approach from the Biden administration uh, is only giving money to people of color and uh, the only white people who are gonna get it are white women. So that's, so this was, uh, basically like a power grab and an economic grab. So you can't have really a kind of a a fair argument brought to the table about wages for everybody. Uh, It it has to be dissected along, um, you know, gender and ethnic and racial lines. Uh, Or take the news of what recently happened in Canada with the discovery of something like 200 Native children, their their bodies were discovered at a school in British Columbia. Um, on TikTok, there's all these guys, you know, making these videos that are there to shame white people. Some of these people are white, and some of them are let's it was one Arab guy, and they will go on and on about you know the white you know white supremacy, even though I think these deaths happened over 55 years ago. None, nonetheless, you know, they were an injustice, they were a mistake, but notice how all, as I said, you saw the aspirational types, you know, rise to the fore, and they were there to wag the fingers at, an, at another ethnic group as a kind of collective guilt. But they don't actually, they, don't, they won't show you a video of how, you know, they wrote a scathing letter to the prime minister or to the PM or to any representative in Canadian parliament in order to deal with the issue, right? All the effort, all the attention is directed at another group within the system. The government is, is you know, deep state or the cathedral, whatever you want to call it, is deeply thankful for this. 
because there's no pressure or responsibility on their part in that sense. Now, the six o'clock news will be a bit more fair. They will, uh, of course, um, you know, bring on a representative uh, that's going to deal with the issue. But the vast majority of the coverage, even on state sponsored television in Canada, will still focus on, on, on the guilt and shame. There should be a portion of that. But the but all the avenues to change this outcome, all the avenues to investigate what happened are there. They're open. No one is impeding that. But the uh, the impression must be made as if th there were impediments to it. It's right? kind of like there, how this recent really, real push not. over the um, I, I don't want to say the name of it because I think uh, you two might have a problem with it, but the race riots about 100 years ago that took place in a certain place in Oklahoma, I think you guys know what I'm getting at, how yeah. recently AstroTurf it is and how it just becomes more and more gruesome every time they mention it. It started with, oh, it was a few dozen, now it's several hundreds, now we're up in the towards 3,000 uh, casualties of that event. Yeah. And uh, again, they're really AstroTurfing this, and of course this brings the questions like, Oh, well, white-black relation issues. And, again, I, this is not to go back to say, oh, there's no difference between the races, the ethnicities, whatever, beyond what the elites tell us. I mean, again, those differences exist, and they're just very easily exploited. And there's things you can do to reduce those tensions, definitely. But, again, as you were saying, they are, they are over the moon that people are focusing on this and not on this right here, this image I'm about to show you, that will probably put just a good, you know, put things in perspective when it comes to inflation. I saw this on Twitter today. It was going around normie conservative circles about uh, inflation and price increases of materials. Now, this these are just, like, right here, just lumber. And, again, you won't be able to see this, but our audience will. And what lumber you could get for $1,000 in the fall of 2020 and what you could get in May 2021, and it's about, if I had to judge, less than a quarter of what it is, and again, just showing the skyrocketing in prices for what you get for $1,000, and this is like for building, like basic building material for like basic construction, so mm -hmm. they like it, and again, not to get on too much of just like the binary thing, like oh, only economic issues matter, only class issues matter, etc., which I mean, again, they're important, but so are identity issues. And I say, uh, again, they they both play off of each other. But right when they when they in the way that they use identity issues to stifle economic issues. Yes, the most because e economically, the greatest downturn has been basically for you know, it's not every ethnic group, but the largest one is whites. You know, we talk we talk about the fentanyl epidemic. Yeah, right. The white working but if you class, make except. if you make gay rights and black rights more important than talking about that, you've just eschewed like a major talking point. Uh, not not just a major talking point, but a major issue, right? You've put that off on the back burner, and it sends the message that it, this is not a priority. We have other priorities. Yeah, because sorry, who, I didn't mean to interrupt. Yeah, who cares about the white guy in West Virginia who used to be a coal miner? who just, you know, overdosed on opiates, or the guy in Pennsylvania who used to be a steel worker until his jobs got shipped overseas, you know, who cares about his, you know, fentanyl addiction, whatever, when there is just a an epidemic of police brutality against um, BIPOC, as they call them now, or yeah. um, abortion rights might be threatened, you might not be able to get, you know, a third trimester abortion in Alabama, or... Uh, gay people might not be able to get married in, in this religious institution that, you know, they only want to get married in because they said they can't. And, again, it, it does divert from those issues, and, again, it does play on those, you know, things. And it's it's a tired talking point, but it's like, oh, well, you know, they're white, so nobody cares about them. They're white men. Who cares about them? But, again, this image right here, I think, it, it's, it's just a good visual representation of what we have here is that, these people have royally screwed the economy so much, and all they will inundate you with is, again, videos of Biden and Kamala just, you know, strutting around the halls of the White House and talking about rights for X minority group. And, again, not to hammer on the point too much, but, I mean, not that I ever really 
condoned gay rights on the show. Not that I ever thought, like, oh, it would be good in absence of X corporate support or X state support. I, I've always had an either apathy or aversion towards it. But now, especially, I would say from, like, 2019 onward, it has become a cudgel. It has, it has become, again, an issue to put above all issues. This is a national focus. And to contrast this, we'll get into some stuff about Russia later. This is our civilizational truth now. Yeah. But that's all I had on that issue in particular with the uh, global homogeneity. So I suppose we can move into the news about Belarus and Russia. And you have delved much deeper into this Belarus news and have, I would say, a much deeper understanding of it than I do. So I will let you take over from here just for this next bit here. Sure. So I can't remember whether it was last week or the week before, but we were talking about the whole issue with Roman Protasevich. Um, uh, he's the fellow whose plane was grounded uh, in Belarus and Minsk before reaching Lithuania, uh, uh, apparently because of uh, a bomb scare on board, which has been widely dismissed by, by most Westerners and probably a fair bit in, in Russia and in Belarus as well. Yeah, Lukashenko, uh, one of the big theories there, Lukashenko hired Hamas to hijack this plane or some some crap like that. That was the one they were running with initially. Right, right. Um, but in the meantime, uh, Protasevich, who's, who's in jail at the moment, uh, facing prosecution, has come, has come out and has said that his... Relationship with Tikhanovskaya, this is the, the school teacher who would become president, remember her last year, and uh, she took off to Lithuania to hide out. Well, um, it looks like, uh, according to Protasevich, uh, their relationship has soured. Uh, he tweeted out the following. I filmed Tikhanovskaya's visit to Athens. Everything was fine. We worked for two days. He praised me, he, uh, he flew away, and then in less than a week, the attitude towards me changed to the opposite. I talked with him, and he said, we need to consider the prospects for further cooperation, the, you know, the detainee explained. So uh, he goes on to, uh, to highlight some other things. In addition, uh, Ryanair, who flew uh, by, uh, by plane, spoke about a conflict with a person who could set him up. According to Protasevich, he wrote 40 minutes before departure where and how he intends to fly. Um, a Ryanair flight from Athens to Vilnius landed in the capital of Belarus on the 23rd. Uh, I'm just trying to get to the part. So, yes, uh, it also is possible that the comrades in arms, the, op uh, the opposition camp, simply handed him over to Belarusian authorities as a result of an internal conflict. So basically, this was one of the hypotheses that we talked about, that he might have been sabotaged by his own. Uh, so we know that Tyanovskaya was also in Greece, and the, the, she obviously flew some other way or maybe stayed behind, and Pyatt, uh, the U.S. ambassador to Greece was there, of course, concocting something. I'm, I'm sure the the Color Revolution Part Two. He's the guy that was uh, the uh, the ambassador to Ukraine uh, back during the Obama era when they uh, uh, fomented the Kiev coup. Um, so it looks like. You know, he's not in a very good spot right now. Um, he would not have, like, for him to have texted something like that out would mean that things are going pretty badly, right? Because, I mean, honestly, it, um, it would be like making himself obsolete. I mean, it's over. At this point, I think he knows it's over for him. Uh, he's not going to be resuscitated. Uh, he, ha you know, the West has been unable to um, create a hubbub about him. 
uh, that might be because of all the photos that exist of him in Azov. Uh, it may be because they have other fish to fry. But um, in the end, it looks like, you know, that it wasn't so much that Lukashenko figured something out, but that Lukashenko was probably tipped off by the opposition with some interlocutor in between them who is doing who is facilitating this. Um, and I haven't there's nothing from Tianovskaya claiming that uh, this is untrue on Protasevich's part. Uh, so, yes. That uh, that that's, those are those developments so far, I would suspect that this you know there's going to be a fallout over this, and that probably you know, uh, color Re- Belarusian color Re- uh, color revolution part two might not be even as successful as it was the year before. Uh, yeah, it's I don't know how much like I don't think Protasevich is such a galvanizing figure. That without him, there couldn't be another uh, series of marches that would go on for weeks and months. Um, he might be galvanizing in the sense that he's like a kind of, I don't know, like a, a sort of uh, martyr-like figure. But I don't know how instrumental he is. Um, I, I, I think they're not... It's going to be a limited audience that's going to galvanize around him just because of his quote unquote martyr status, because I, I think at this point he's tainted. Um, the new cycle is done with him. Uh, there's too many, you know, stories about him uh, in Azov now that you can't dispel it. You can't disprove it. There's not one photo of this guy wearing a helmet or a flak jacket or any military paraphernalia that he's wearing that says press on it and furthermore to that end you know journalists don't wear all the fatigues like on some level they want to be seen so they'll wear a blue flak jacket yeah they'll they'll wear wear it quite literally just for protection because again and if you want to go by international law which is very selectively applied and whatever it is technically a war crime to kill a journalist so they want to make themselves seen so, again, since if they blend in, that's just making them liable to get shot at. When If you're supposed to be somebody just covering this, and as, as dumb as the concept of a combat zone journalist is, in my opinion, not that other journalists are any better, so to speak, again, you want to, you want to stick out like a sore thumb so you don't get shot. And, again, it's very clear that he was an active combatant, in the conflict, and I, I can only imagine how the narrative would be if, say, he were fighting for the Donetsk People's Republic side, or yeah, any of the pro-Russian sides, we wouldn't hear the end of this, and again, this plot seemed just really sloppy, like, okay, I can find the rationale, okay, so... Psyop journalist slash former militia fighter, he's on this plane, they force it to land, he gets arrested for being, again, agent of Western global homogeneity, so to speak. That is yeah. supposed to incite big rally, that innocent man in prison, people of Belarus rise up, overthrow evil dictator, Russia gets inspired, overthrows Putin. I think that's, a, you know, in very simplistic, very crude terms, that was the general plot they had. And, again, yeah. it looked like that fizzled out into nothing. I don't know if they were trying with this. This guy who was, like, a relative nobody, at least as dumb as the Navalny stuff was, Navalny had a name presence. Even if he was hated by a lot of people, even if he was viewed as a clown, he had a name presence and even served as just a broad opposition figure to rally around. Because you had cases in Russia where the Communist Party, the second largest party in the country, which um, Zhuganov... I don't think he's currently the leader, but I know he's one of the most influential members. Actually, it caused an internal split within the party that some people said we shouldn't be supporting this Western agent trying to subvert a country. Others saying we don't care what he is. He's a good springboard for a real opposition movement. So you have that at least with Navalny. With this guy, there isn't even that. And again, it's more pathetic than yeah. Tinovskaya. And really what it looks like is 
whoever is plotting this sort of thing, whether that be the CIA, whether that be the MI6, whether that be some other European intelligence agency, State Department, British Foreign Ministry, whoever is plotting it, they are either outsourcing this to interns, saying, uh, you, oh, hey, who wants to help us overthrow the Belarusian government, or really scraping the bottom of the barrel, because I don't, like, yeah, I see the broad plot here, but, like, actually putting pen to paper and writing this up, I don't even see how, in theory, they thought this would come to fruition in any form. Right. I mean, he's an expendable pawn. If he's captured, um, sanctions are going to come on. Now, we can debate about the effectiveness, uh, effectiveness of sanctions, but the truth is, is they assuage the, 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 the Western public. Uh, it makes them feel, not all of them, a lot of them doubt their efficacy, but for much of the Western public, they look at slapping off, uh, on of sanctions both as a sign of, uh, you know, Western economic power, but also the ability to inflict pain on on the enemies of the West, as it were. Now, as you know, I also want to bring up one more detail about uh, about um, Protasevich, and that is when we first brought him up. You know, we mentioned that he thought he was being watched uh at the airport and so on well it might be this might make sense because in his statement he mentioned franak vyachorka and uh franak is uh an advisor to tihanovskaya and it was you know it was on belarusian television that he made this statement um that was um the publication about the arrest of Protasevich, even at the moment when he was standing in line for customs and border control. So the arrest hadn't even happened. And, the, you know, this guy, uh, Yachorka, uh, had already made the statement that he had been arrested before he had been arrested. Right. So how did he know that that would happen? How did he know for sure? You know. He has to be on the inside. So that that's an interesting thing. And so I think Protasevich has figured out that he's been abandoned. He was, uh, he's disposable. You know, he's dispensable. He's also replaceable. And, and that's it. Yes. And I, again, like I see like where you're coming out with that rationale, but when they actually decided how to implement this, I don't see... I'm surprised it didn't fall apart sooner, is what I'm getting at. And really, uh -huh. I, again... Good point. Yeah, like I mean, considering the fact how fast it's on the media, I say shows how big of a failure it is that they shut this up. I mean, of course, in the circles we saw it, like, it gets run in the, the regular Western media. It gets run from the other perspective in places like RT, Sputnik, South Front, etc., but even, like, when you go on, like, onto Western cable news, you know, think CNN, Fox, MSNBC, like, the place where most people, like, would at a glance see their news, like, they're not covering that. Like, in even, like, on yeah. their websites, like, on their video sections, like, they're not talking about that because nobody cares because, I mean, at least with the protests in Belarus in regard to the election last summer, there was a bit of a story there. There was something that could compel people. And I think those were largely overshadowed by literally everything else going on in 2020, we, as we went over in our year in review episode back in the end of December, of course, beginning of January. But this one, I don't know how they thought this had a snowball's chance in hell. And yeah. I, again, and I, I can just keep repeating this point over and over, but this is, I'm, I'm going to say hands down, we've seen a lot of dumb ones. We've seen a lot of stupid intelligence agency, a lot of stupid State Department plots. I say this hands down takes cake as the dumbest one I've ever seen. Yeah, I mean, basically, if you're kind of a, a, a Lukashenko supporter or you're indifferent you and, and you're living in Belarus or Russia, you kind of have to hand it off to him that he was right this time. Um, that that even amongst the, uh, the activists, there is... Uh, a kind of infighting where they're, you know, willing to out each other for really a tact, you know, a tactical move that only produces short-term gains. Yes, and 
With that being said, I suppose we can move into the news about Russia proper, which this, I, I, could, I couldn't decide whether I this would be the big news of the show or whether Israel would be the big news of the show, but I think this just ever so slightly won out. Because what we have here is Russia is now completely decoupling its reserves from the U.S. dollar. And they're going to, of course, replace that with the Chinese yuan, the euro of the European Union, of course, as well as other major currencies. And I think what we've seen, honestly, is relations between the U.S. and Russia deteriorate to the point where the U.S., for all this time, now, it is a nuclear option, so to speak, and we also have this nuclear option in China, and it'll be interesting to see if they follow suit, where we can tamper, of course, with our currency and do things for our currencies to directly affect their reserves. Now, of course, that would come at a cost to us, a cost that we, I don't know, maybe 10 years ago, I don't know so much now, could could stand. It would be a hit to us, it would be a hit particularly to the American people, but we could stand it to get one up on Russia and or China at that point. I think that ability is quickly fading fast if it's not already faded, where we could do that without doing any significant long-term damage to ourselves. But again, I do think the Russian fears about that were running high, which led them to do this. Now, of course, this has been a very gradual process, and it is almost funny because of the sanctions regime on Russia ever since the annexation of Crimea has driven them into such a corner where, really, I would say they had the opposite of intended effect. That's going down to things like revival of domestic Russian industry, increased cooperation between Russia and China, increased cooperation between Russia and the renegade states of Europe, so to speak, and, to top it all off, a potential decoupling from the U.S. dollar. Now, very risky move. Now, you may say, well, this isn't Saddam Hussein in Iraq, this isn't some third world dictator who is trying to assert country with financial independence you're right it's not russia can go toe-to-toe on it with the u.s on most issues it can at least hold its own against american influence but still taking on the international financial elite is a dangerous game now i'm not saying putin's going to get assassinated because of this or anything i don't think that's going to happen but it is a very it's a minefield let's put it that way you, yeah. you take one step. It, it could have it could have negative economic yeah. outcomes uh, for Russia. Catastrophic negative economic yeah. outcomes. And again, this is coupled with again, Russia's been gradually doing this, and ever since Putin came into power, they've been slowly but surely increasing their gold reserves. And again, it looks like they're finally pulling the plug. It looks like Russia is going with their nuclear option. Now, it could be we're doing our episode three weeks from now saying oh, it's a complete bluff on Russia's part, they're not going to do it yet, or maybe they're going to do it gradually, but again, I think now especially, they've bided their time, they've looked at the geopolitical situation with the U.S., I would say, probably over the past 10 years, maybe if, when we, if we want to be more particular, since about 2013, when U.S.-Russian relations really started to sour between Syria, Crimea, etc., and they said this is going to have to happen sooner or later, so we're going to monitor the situation and await to see what the best moment to pull that plug is. And I would say it looks like they found a pretty good moment too with American influence on the backside with even Biden who's supposed to be the adult in the room even his presence is noticeably absent from the world stage. You haven't seen much about him. He's been again relative radio silence from the Biden administration minus again videos of them walking or Kamala Harris saying something or again I I would say the most vocal member of the Biden administration thus far has been Anthony Blinken without a doubt which mm-hmm. isn't surprising it seems like he is really the only one in America speaking on the foreign policy issue at least on the American regime and I think he's really the go-to guy when it comes to dealing with America on a diplomatic level. I mean, that is the job of the Secretary of State, but I mean, to the point where he's even completely supplanted Biden, Biden's a complete absentee. Uh, Kamala Harris has, I think, attended more diplomatic functions than Biden at this point, and definitely Blinken has attended more than both of them, and I don't know if I... I think he's... I think Blinken, if I had to say, I've said this before, I think he's the real mover and shaker in the administration. Now, of course, domestic Uh policy aside, because that's all the job of the bureaucrats and the regime. Of course, the president does have some influence there, and the cabinet has some influence there. 
I think the main man directing the imperial side of America right now is probably Anthony Blinken, if I had to just take a guess on that much, on that front. But, again, that's that's just another side. I, I could do an entire episode complaining about Blinken and talking about Blinken. Uh, as, as much as I dislike him, very fascinating figure, and I think probably one of the most powerful men in America at this point, uh, at least on the world stage, that is. But, you know, with all that being yeah. said, it looks like Russia has finally gone with this. But you were pointing out to me before the show this very weird dynamic between the U.S. and Russia when it comes to oil trade. Now, last year under the Trump administration saw record highs of U.S. imports of oil from Russia. Now, of course, when we had that complete oil shock where oil went into the negatives, Trump outright announced that, yeah, we're pretty much going to be buying everyone's discounted oil. We're going to get it while it's cheap and stock up on our reserves. So that included everyone from pretty much everyone except sanctioned states like Venezuela and Iran we were buying oil from. And even I have my doubts that we didn't unofficially buy oil from them, but that's aside the point. And, again, it looks like the trend has continued, especially with the energy crisis in the U.S., especially with, you know, funny enough, Biden <laughs> shutting down American pipelines. And you had Nord Stream 2, the whole debacle over that, and Biden backing down on that. So it, maybe he's just, you know, smuggling Russian energy sources in the back door because that's really all we can do at this point, which, again, doesn't surprise me, but it also is a way to sort of keep uh, in interdependence, so to speak, to try to keep Russia within the sphere of the global economic order. Not that they're going to be completely isolated from the economic order, but to provide them something so substantial. Now, again, I know we've went over Russian energy exports are only about like 6% of their economy, but still, something that, something as vital as the energy market keeping them in there. And I do think the right. whole thing about all of this is what I've noticed here is the idea that currency itself has become a commodity. Now, of course, this is nothing new. I would say this was, of course, the entire 20th century with really the start of things like the Federal Reserve and the modern form of central banking, that is, and um, the end and of the things like a gold standard of a silver standard. But yes, this the currency itself has become the commodity, which has created such a headache when... I mean, we're only talking about these issues from a mile away. I can only imagine what it's like to actually work deep within the financial sector or international finance. Not that I have respect for any of these people, don't get me wrong, but I can only imagine what a headache that kind of job is. Right. I mean, I, I've speculated in the past, you know, that um, inflation in a way will also devalue the dollar, and that includes countries like China and Russia who – have a lot of reserves in in the American dollar. So in a way, them jettisoning the dollar, particularly Russia, uh, and just to get into the uh, nuts and bolts of it, um, so Russia's going to slash 40 billion of its U.S. currency, uh, which is part of their sovereign wealth fund. Um, But now, 40 billion represents about 35% and Russia dropped below 50% of uh, U.S. currency reserves this year. But prior to that, it was just skimming over 50%. But it had been gradually going down on a trend that was at least 12, 13, 14 years long. Uh, so they've been doing it for quite a while. Um, so, you know, what's going to replace it? Uh, well, the euro and the yuan are going to replace it. Uh, so. The euro is going to go up by 40% and the yuan by 30%. But they're also going to slash uh, the, the the British pound uh, from 10 to 5%. So, you know, I guess, you know, why did, why did the U.S. buy, like, the largest reserve of Russian oil this year? It literally broke the previous year's record and the year before that. Um, I don't know. My, I mean, I'm not an expert on this. I wish I was. But, you know, I would say that maybe it's to curry favors. Maybe it's to, um, you know, influence some of the oligarchs. Maybe it's to prop up the American dollar because the trade would happen uh, with American dollars, of course, because it's oil. Um, but I would also say that... Uh, Russia is preparing for the worst. 
Like, that's what this is about. They're preparing for market manipulation. Uh, let's not forget that May 24th represents the day of the EU summit that said that they must work on regime change in Russia. Like, that was their open statement. And when Biden goes to visit Brussels and he meets with other NATO members just two days prior to his meeting with Putin in Geneva, he's going to reiterate something like that. It might be veiled, but it'll be thinly veiled. And so I, that's what I would suspect. I think Russia knows they're in a fight right now. They're in a fight for their sovereignty. And they're going to make the bet that uh, divesting from Britain and from America is the wise choice to make because it's going to go into that situation anyways. You might as well beat them to it and then increase uh, uh, reserves from both the EU and China. Yes, and I think that, again, sums up just about everything I can say. And it does get into the wider debate of what is really the idea going forward? Because, again, and we were speculating this off the show, because now I'm sure there's some elements who have seen America as a milked cow and are really just trying to scrap it for everything they can, see how much they can get at the junkyard for it, and then move on to the next parasite. For example, the people in international finance, the people who are generally parasitic on nations, the global elite, etc. But I'm sure there's more than a few people within the global elite who see the downfall of the American empire as, again, more or less game over for them. So I can only try to figure out what's going on because, again, clearly... This is either being allowed to happen, Russia and China are allowed to do what they can, which I think is the theory a lot of people come up with when they say, like, oh, it's all just big conspiracy, it's all just controlled opposition, etc. Or, at some point over the past 15, 20 years, which we've gone into, they made a handful of major, major miscalculations to where you have this start to happen. They vastly underestimated, and I, some may say coddled China. They wrote off Russia as no longer a threat, and then went into overdrive in, in confronting Russia after 2014 with Crimea. And really, what you can see here is them scrambling to make up for the mistakes. I would say, I don't know, since the end of the Cold War, when they let their guard down after the collapse of the Soviet Union, or when they went on all these adventures in the Middle East regarding the Taliban or Al-Qaeda or Iran or whatever. And again, I think at some point, especially with the goals of the international elite, especially with how much influence increased over the government, and I would say, again, going back to the power of the certain group of people we're not allowed to mention, Israeli influence became such a staple after the Cold War and especially after 9-11 that it became horse blinders for the American establishment. Uh, protecting Israel, standing by our greatest ally, is literally the only thing that happens. Everything else be damned. Now, again, that's not to make the argument that the American empire should be like this, you know, grand global force that controls every movement in the world. I think that's been not beneficial for the American nation or the American people at all. Now, I, could, I can tolerate some degree of imperialism. I can hear those arguments. I can see why using your strength on the world stage to actually benefit your own people... You know, there's an argument for that, but that's aside the point. That's not what I'm getting at. But, again, from their perspective, they, they put on these horse blinders, they pursued all these Middle Eastern policies, they pursued all these little adventures at the cost of, again, letting Russia and China reassert themselves. And now they're scrambling, now they're in absolute panic to undo the mistakes of the past 15, 20 years. And genuinely, I don't think they can undo it. I think they landed themselves with a new Cold War, and I think it's, uh, maybe Cold War's a bit of a drastic term, but I think they landed themselves in a new multipolar world, not only including Russia and China, but increasingly Europe, increasingly some parts of the Middle East. We'll see the direction Africa goes with the neo-colonial programs of both China and France extending to the broader European Union. Again, and just all these rising powers, maybe even India, hell, maybe even India. But we'll just see how all that goes, but I think they have 
in their overreaction, bitten off way more they can, than they can chew at this current moment. Yeah, uh, you know, and the, also the world is very different with uh, what Russia is trying to accomplish. Uh, Russia was in terrible relations with China uh, near the close of the Vietnam War, and is partly why China, in a sense, succeeded, because America quickly and wisely knew that by partnering with China, by giving them, you know, a, um, a deal of a century, really, uh, that they could prosper. Uh, I mean, Russian and Chinese relations were even horrible in the 80s, considering the fact China was uh, actually China manufactured the arms that we gave to the Mujahideen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That 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 lets you know how how bad it was, and so. I would say that at the time, uh, there wasn't really anywhere else Russia could turn to diversify its investment portfolio. And we're not in that world anymore. Uh, China isn't what China was in the late 70s, not even by a long shot. And um, uh, this will probably act uh, – it it'll hasten other countries who have been thinking about doing what Russia has done to act more quickly, particularly countries that have uh, invested in the One Belt, One Road. Uh, you know, Blinken has, was, is in Asia at the moment. He's, I guess he's either leaving today or departing soon. Uh, don't quote me on that, but I know he was in Papua New Guinea recently, and, you know, he's telling Papua New Guinea that, you know, don't fall for Chinese economic coercion, you know, uh, um, the international rules-based order is going to get very upset. Um, I mean, of course, uh, China is going to give them loans that they can't possibly pay back, but the IMF does that too. So, you know, I mean, part of the reason why we have this problem in Belarus is because I think Lukashenko, I think him refusing the IMF loan, which was which stipulated that to do so would mean he would have to go under extreme lockdown, which a country like Belarus, which, you know, it has a tentative um, e economy, but is not, you know, at the level of, say, I don't know, Moldova or Romania or Ukraine, it's far better off. Um that would be taking chances. I mean, if he had done that, he would be, he would be, he would have been finished. Uh, anyway, so it was, you know, die if you do, die if you don't. Um, so, you know, the world is going to now, at, le at the very least, we'll go into a bipolar world. And you know that America is, is, is really gearing up for this. There are, they're squeezing the hands. They're they're making sure Australia understands what it has to do with, you know, with its uh, its coal industry, particularly China's use of it, the coal industry, and uh, also, of course, uh, you know, the beef market. They need to stop all this development, and they need a lot of countries to be on board to stop this development, because this development is setting up a rivalry to the West. And that's what they're here to stop. So in a sense, Russia might be acting hastily or it might be acting right on time. In, in any case, the, you know, the day where, you know, America could potentially have helped to sabotage Russia economically through, I, I mean, I, I can't imagine how, but that, that possibility exists. And so, you know, Russia making this move to preclude that is probably a very difficult choice, but probably one of the few choices that they have, considering where this trajectory is going. Absolutely. I, I, again, there's not much more I can add to that with you saying that. And I do think what we are looking at right here is... Again, a world that sees America, especially after the, what the past, I would say since late Obama administration when they real, 
again, I think Syria and Crimea were the two big pivotal points when really it showed that America was not all it was cracked up to be. When a lot of the world saw China as a preferable partner, China really started hitting its economic boom, really started reasserting itself as a player on the world stage. Again, same with Russia. And, again, especially with all the lucrative economic deals China had offered all these developing nations, I figured they looked at it and they... It, it was probably a choice of a lesser evil. They looked at what the IMF, what the Western powers had put in front of them, and they looked at what China had put in front of them, and they said, we'd rather take our chance with the Chinese. Now, maybe that would worked out for them, maybe it didn't. I think time will tell long term. You can talk a lot about China debt-trapping places and uh, exploiting them for resources. And as you were saying, virtually every economic power does that. That's just a consequence of the economic system the world runs on right now. And really, if you have a problem with that, you have a problem with usury, which is... You, you want to go back that far? I mean, I, that's something I'm willing to do one of these days, but you know, not now. But again, that, that well, there's a difference between having a problem with it on principle and then looking at it and realizing, like, why is China doing better at us in our own game rather than saying, well, how can we improve? How can we, you know, outdo the Chinese? It, it all comes down to that. And I think France, again, France has been a really big player in Africa in this. And this is just the new multipolar world, what we're looking at. It's going to be a war of investments. Now, of course, I imagine there will be some actual firing of shots. I'm sure we'll get plenty of proxy wars across these nations, particularly in Africa. I've been predicting that we're probably going to see some pretty intense French-Chinese proxy wars in Africa. That's just a long-term speculation, though. But with how much both of those countries are investing in various, again, uh, former French colonies or just various countries in Africa in general, with how much France and China are both in that, they're eventually going to trade blows in some form or another. Maybe not directly, maybe through proxy groups, but they will trade blows nonetheless. And, again, what we're looking at right here is Really, just to hammer the point home, as I've been saying for the past 15 minutes here, you had a China that nobody would have expected to rise to this level of power, because, of course, you had normalization of relations in the 70s under Nixon. You had an increase of U.S.-China trade into the 80s and 90s, which I would say had been an upward trajectory until Trump. Trump did a trade war, which somewhat stifled China, but also somewhat safe for the United States just because of how interlinked the economies are. But especially now that Trump is out of office and Biden, at least at first, won this big reconciliation with China, but realizing that's impossible at this point. Again, I think China has pretty... Look, barring some major event, and some people thought it might have been the coronavirus, which apparently it didn't pan out to be that way. And I, I thought about going over the Fauci emails. I might do that next week as more information about those coming out, but I just couldn't find a place to fit them in today. But again, unless, I don't know, say an actual plague it does strike China and does some extreme amount of economic damage to them, we could see that. But China's trajectory for the time being is on the up and up. And that is thanks to them being a beneficiary of the short-sightedness and greed of the American empire, of the liberal empire as a whole. Yeah. Um, I mean, Kissinger literally did not believe that they would ever evolve to anything that they are now. That's why they thought it was such a safe bet. And, and it was primarily done, basically, to destroy the Soviet Union, right? Oh, yes. And, I mean, at the time... When you have Nixon shaking Mao's hand and with the way, with the the decades of Mao in power now, again, Mao is not a black and white figure yet. Of course, his reign was brutal and bloody, I mean, but that's China for you. I wouldn't uh, attribute that particularly to him. But also, his plans for modernizing China were underwhelming. Not saying they were complete failure, but they were underwhelming by many, many metrics, but that's, again, a discussion for a different day. Looking at China in the 70s, thinking, hmm, the secondary power of this country that's just now dragging its head above the water, you know, we could work with them. We could just use them, just barely tip the balance against the Soviet Union, which, again, made sense at the time. Kissinger's, Kissinger's initial perception of China, I think, made sense, but 
when you start to get into the 80s and the 90s, when they start to see this economic development, and you more and more increase economic ties with them, still holding that view that you may have held in 1972, I think is not only naive, but it has to be willfully ignorant. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's baffling because historically we know that China had this remarkable past. Um, you know, prior to when the European powers went in there and, um, you know, took over uh, literally at gunpoint to force them to trade. Uh, which also happened in Korea and, and Japan as well. Uh, I think there was a few, I, again, it's that neoliberal idea, right? That, uh, that uh, you know, we're the masters now, we're, we're king, uh, this is the future. Um, it's this very linear idea of time that, um, uh, you know, the end of history, as it were, right? And it, it was only a few decades later that, you know, less than two decades later or a little over two decades later that Fukuyama wrote, you know, the end of history. Kind of like, well, you know, um, China was a thing for m many thousands of years. And, you know, at one time they even had, you know, ex exploratory ships and, and vessels that, you know, went to Madagascar and went all over the place. Right. Giant vessels with farms on them and farm animals. Uh, nothing that the world had ever seen before. Now, that was a short period of time in, in, in China's history that they did that. But they were generally, you know, the power of the uh, of the East. And um, so this idea that they would never rise, that they would get over, that they would accept their humiliation from the 19th century and uh, they would never plan. They would never in, in, a, in a very um, wise way latch on to this opportunity that had been given them and find a way out of their uh, their dilemma. And they succeeded, right? And they, they, you know, another example of like, here's a country that's <laughs> overturned and, you know, there's a communist revolution and there's all kinds of banks banking this. Nudge, nudge, wudge, wink. <laughs> nudge, nudge, wink, wink. <laughs> and, uh, but they do manage to make something that is of themselves and for themselves first. So, uh, you know, that's, you know, like him or hate him, that's something to appreciate. Yes, and I would say that with what we have there, um, it, it is. And again, we were just talking before the show, and we've talked on previous shows, that China is this mercantile power that historically they have been into their culture that sends its goods outward. And it depends on at what point in history you're talking about. Sometimes they're known for these luxurious exotic goods that you can't you you can't you you would die to get your hands on and of course in the modern era and again it it ebbs and flows cheap consumer goods now that is starting to be diversified but really one could say china is with the belt and road initiative trying to rebuild the silk road returning to tradition mm -hmm. yes becoming oh, yeah. uh, becoming an international trading hub and again we've We've hit on this point several times. Now, China does have global ambitions, but I don't think China has this idea of remaking the world in its image, for example, that the United States had or the British Empire might have had or any other European power might have had, which can be as detestable as admirable, depending on, of course, what your particular goal is at the time. I think there's some very admirable things about European imperialism. I think there were some very detestable things about European imperialism. And unfortunately, I think the United States, and at least in its current form, takes after the more testable forms. But again, I don't think the Chinese people, I don't think the Chinese civilization have that spirit of wanting to mold the world in a Chinese image. I think they just want to see, well, how can we get rich? Which, again, that's a respectable goal in and of itself. But, for example, I make this point all the time, they're very into their culture. Now, sure, they are teaching Chinese for the sake of business and trade, but it doesn't compare to, for example... Um, foreign language programs uh, like in English offered in non-English speaking countries or French, etc. 
I'd say English and French being the big two with those ones, or even Russian and, for example, a lot of the former Soviet Union and Eastern Europe and just the areas within Russia's sphere of influence. Again, the Chinese are very insular about that. Not that they, like, actively prevent people from trying to learn Chinese, but beyond a few cases here and there, they don't go out of their way to establish Chinese schools in Africa. Like I said, they do, but again, it's it's not like they believe the world should be speaking Chinese, conforming to the Chinese customs, etc. They just want to make a quick buck, which, like I said, I can respect. And maybe things will go on, maybe if China does become more powerful, they will want to start to make the world in their image, but just based on what I know about Chinese history, which I'm not going to say I'm an expert or anything, but I would say I know a fair amount, they literally just want to be a trading power. Now, they may want to be a global trading power, they may want to be the world's economic engine, but I don't see them wanting to be a cultural or civilization engine of the world. I don't think they have that within right. their national or civilizational spirit. At least that's what I'm looking at. Now, I could be wrong, maybe you disagree with me, whatever, but that's the way I see it right now. Right, right. Everybody understands that uh, when Blinken uh, uh, appeals to China by essentially scolding it at the Alaska summit, talking about, you know, values, <laughs> human rights, he's talking about, you know, the latest um, civic religion that has incarnated itself in the West, Right. And it's understood that that is that is a kind of soft power uh, expression, and um, that has an enormous effect on the youth of the world. Uh, many of them, you know, see that this is, uh, you know, they believe that this is the future. So the the kind of impression and the kind of cultural um, uh, cachet that America has for the world is extraordinary even today no one no one can equal it um despite china's strength you know like the chinese are not they're not wearing clothes from like their high period they're they're wearing european clothes so it's very pervasive in fact it's so pervasive people don't pick up on it right um but yes so they they you know they there's there i don't personally believe that they are interested in re, they're not going to replace america meaning that they're not going to give the world a new belief system yes that, they're not as universalist which i do think again come is yeah. more of a european value which i do think and i'm not saying this i know most people say this in a negative sense comes from christianity now of course i am biased i do believe that is honestly the truth but i do think uh, whether that be actual Christianity, for example, I would say the Spanish Empire is a good example of people who actually believed and wanted to spread their faith, whereas it became something more mechanical, for example, in the British Empire with Anglicanism, Episcopalianism, whatever you want to call it. But again, I think that China, just civilization at this moment, doesn't have that idea of spreading a universal value system, whether that be a religion, whether that be a culture. Now, of course, as you see, as time goes on, it's not like America is, you know, touting the cross around the world. Now, we do when it's convenient. We play up on, you know, Christian sentiments when, you know, we think it can play to our benefit. But mostly, it's this new civic religion, what most people call woke, what I would just call liberalism, because that's what it is. But, again, you get that out of most European countries. I would say even Russia has that to a degree. They, they want a spread of Russian civilization. And you get this, I would say, also in the Middle East with Muslims, but... I would say just with Chinese history, culture, and religion, that may I'm not saying it's not entirely in them. It could come out in them, just depending on how trends go. But f throughout their history and to this day, they don't have that universalist mindset that the whole world must think like China. It's just that the whole world must trade with China and make China rich. Right. And China asking Disney not to include certain scenes that <laughs> like homosexual or, or biracial love uh, is not the same thing as uh, China dictating to the rest of the world uh, its, its idea of truth, right? They're concerned for their public, for their society, not the same thing. Yeah, like uh, I said, a very insular, very closed off people. They want your money, but they want nothing more. And again, for better and for worse, it's, you know, they... They, they couldn't care less about you so long as you don't disturb their efforts to get rich. And 
uh, interfere with insular Chinese society, which I, I know I keep on repeating this point over and over, but I think it's worth repeating because I think a lot of people still, you know, and not even like to criticize them, you know, coming from this Western mindset, which is more universalist, which, like I said, isn't necessarily a bad thing. I think they're extrapolating that on China just because that's that's just their frame of mind. Right. And it's uh, it's very rare that a, a civilization with such deep attachments to ancestors uh, thinks that the, in the future that they're going to um, universalize their main thinker, Confucius, and uh, Confucius for the world. And every region of the world will have its own drawing of Confucius with, you know, the pigmentation will be slightly different, wearing their clothes and it, that's just not going to happen. That's it, it's just not. The, the Chinese are not interested in blurring the lines about what it means to be Chinese. They can, of course, get away with it to a certain degree. Uh, within China proper, uh, most of the other ethnic groups, save the Uyghurs and, and a few others, uh, can look quite different than them. However, most of them do not. Most of them look uh, very Asian. Um, so in, in a way, it's more kind of like a dominant people that would take over Europe, you know, and everybody essentially, they might be different, different ethnic groups, but they're not necessarily different racial groups. Yes, I, I would definitely agree on that. But, well, I think that covers about everything for today unless you have any last minute stories you'd like to bring up now uh i don't have any last minute stories but i do want to plug uncle thomas's channel i i really am liking the, the content i don't have as much time as last summer when i would it, it, the tune in work is just a, a lot more frenetic right now than it used to be but i'm really enjoying his his content on very much uh current issues but also uh, uh, historical issues, and, and he's he's quite. He hasn't made a, a, a video on China lately, but uh, he has in the past before. They're very well done, and so I just want a, a shout out to Uncle Thomas for his great content. Yeah, of course, and he is a uh, semi regular in the chat. I see him here and there. He comments stuff, so definitely yeah. go check that out. Um, in fact, I didn't know that he actually produced stuff, so I I, I might actually take a look at that myself. But, yeah, and, again, if you're in here, if you're listening, feel free whenever just to spam links to your stuff. I, I won't bother. Now, of course, all my regular viewers, you have, like, all the permissions on the channel with the wrench. I do that for the sake of convenience. You know, if you stick around long enough, you know, I figured it's, it's easier for me not to moderate the chat. So, you know, th there you go, guys. Um, that covers everything for this time. And we will see you next time on The War Report, and goodbye. Take care.